The agency takes uh, in nuclear safety a relatively modest role compared to nuclear safeguards, for instance, the non-proliferation side of things, but a supportive role. It's more in that mode that it, that it has its role. And uh, Fukushima really drew attention to the fact that the states hadn't given the agency enough authority or enough resources to assist in the case of, the, of an accident uh, of the Fukushima type. So in some ways the agency was caught off guard by this. Many people had expectations that the agency would, for instance, provide a great deal of information about the uh, incident, uh, even generic in information about what type of reactor was involved, what were the generic risks, but the agency didn't really feel it had the mandate to do that. It certainly wasn't very keen to do it immediately. It did over time. But there was a sense that, that expectations of the agency exceeded its abilities. I think the incident and emerging centre worked quite well. They got that into being straight away within 24 hours. Uh, but the question was then what resources were devoted to it. They had to scramble to bring staff um, into it to, to man the centre 24 hours while this long emergency was going on. The agency also wasn't able, it turns out, to say publicly what the scale of this accident was. There is a scale that is used interna internationally which is owned by the IAEA, but it turns out that the country that has the accident is the one that expresses the scale of the disaster, which seems rather strange because you expect that in that case the country will be downplaying how dangerous the, the disaster was. So you really need a, an independent body like the IEA to be saying how big this disaster is. So that was another weakness that we discovered. Um, and unfortunately Japan didn't trigger the convention on assistance in the case of an emergency. So the agency did have a relatively minor list of countries that would be able to offer assistance. And as soon as it notified all countries of the emergency, it, it, it had a lot of uh, offerings of assistance, but Japan simply said we were not going to accept it. They were going to try and deal with the emergency themselves. And in some way that's understandable because it was very unexpected. It was a, a very large uh, disaster, something that no one had anticipated. So you can imagine the Japanese themselves were, were quite stunned at what had happened and in some ways were not in a position to say what assistance they required in the early days. And as time went on, you could less understand why they didn't seek assistance through the IAEA, but they actually didn't use that system at all. And paradoxically afterwards they criticised it. Uh, but the whole incident revealed that the agency itself doesn't have enough authority or enough resources to assist in this case. So that's something that needs to be attended to. Old facilities were a real part of the problem up to Chernobyl. So all the Soviet style reactors in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union were closed down as a result of the Convention on Nuclear Safety, which uh, had all states examine what the state of their reactors were and these old ones were shut down almost straight away. Uh, currently, uh, states are allowed to maintain any type of reactor they like. They just have to make sure that it's safe. But safe, unfortunately, is not really defined very well. So it still remains for each state to examine its own uh, safety procedures uh, and the safety of its existing nuclear reactors. Fukushima, of course, is changing that. Now we're seeing states feeling an obligation to do these uh, health checks, as it were, on each of their reactors. And some states are uh, uh, still in the process of doing that, but Japan, for instance, has looked at its nuclear reactors and decided not to reopen them immediately while it's conducting all these checks. So the situation is evolving in nuclear safety as it, as it did after Chernobyl. Again, after Fukushima, we're seeing an, another round of uh, insistence that all reactors are safe. And, but the older a reactor gets, the more likely the parts are to wear out and systems break down. They have in many cases being replaced over the years, they've been adding new parts, but still they don't have the same um, safety features as modern nuclear reactors will. So the, the new types of reactors, the generation three, generation four, are supposedly inherently more safer. They're being deliberately designed to be, be safer. For instance, they have safety systems which depend on gravity rather than on human intervention. And presumably that will make them safe. It's impossible to say how safe they'll be, uh, but the assumption is that new technology will enable reactors to be safer. Uh, it has an action plan on nuclear safety, which has been agreed by the member states, and the agency and the members are supposed to be putting this into place. And there are things in there like strengthening the peer review system for safety, so that there are more reviews, 
and they're more thorough and they're done in cooperation with other organisations like the World Association of Nuclear Operators, WANO. They all also conduct peer reviews. There are moves afoot to strengthen the recommendations on nuclear safety, so there's a speeded up process to review those. Uh, unfortunately, they'll only be non-mandatory. Again, that's a problem in nuclear safety. Uh, unlike nuclear safeguards, where there are mandatory requirements, again, in nuclear safety, there's, there's nothing of that type. So unfortunately, uh, we didn't use the window of opportunity presented by this disaster to create a very strong push towards better safety and a bigger role for the IAEA. Uh, the action plan is still evolving. It's still called a draft action plan because it's meant to evolve as we learn more about the accident and as we think more about what could be done to prevent and deal with an accident if it happens. Um, but I'm not very confident there'll be major changes because I think the, the emergency's passed. You, you really have to use this window very quickly to, to affect change within the IAEA. And it's done that effectively in the past, but in the case of Fukushima, it, it, I don't think it's going to do that. So again, I think we'll go back to a very slow evolution of stronger uh, safety standards and a, and a stronger agency role in all of this. Currently, uh, states are allowed to maintain any type of reactor they like. They just have to make sure that it's safe. But safe, unfortunately, is not really defined very well. So it still remains for each state to examine its own. Uh, safety procedures uh, and the safety of its existing nuclear reactors. Fukushima, of course, is changing that. Now we're seeing states feeling an obligation to do these uh, health checks, as it were, on each of their reactors. And some states are, are still in the process of doing that. But Japan, for instance, has looked at its nuclear reactors and decided not to reopen them immediately while it's conducting all these checks. So the situation is evolving in nuclear safety as it, as it did after Chernobyl. Again, after Fukushima, we're seeing an, another round of uh, insistence that all reactors are safe. And, but the older a reactor gets, the more likely the parts are to wear out and systems break down. They have, in many cases, been replaced over the years. They've been adding new parts. But still, they don't have the same um, safety features as modern nuclear reactors will. So the, the new types of reactors, the generation three, generation four, are supposedly inherently more safer. They're being deliberately designed to be, be safer.